Hi, I'm Rajiv, and today I'm having a harp lesson with my teacher, Christy. When I started this channel, I really wanted to metaphorically open the door to my apartment and let all of you come in here. So today, I really want to show you what a harp lesson is like because this magnificent instrument from Lion and Healy is a treasure and learning how to play it has become a priority in my life. So I have Christy Shade with me today who is my wonderful teacher and she's also a professional harpist here in New York City. Christy, your life is an inspiration because you're making a living playing this instrument um, can you tell us like who you've played for and what a what a year in New York City as a harpist looks like, please? Sure. Well, first of all, you're an inspiration because I think of you as a Renaissance man who just explores so many outlets in art and music, and it's just wonderful to see. So it's Thank been you. a joy being your teacher. Um, I, yes, I'm a freelance harpist in New York City, which means I play with a lot of different orchestras and chamber ensembles. Um, I teach privately a lot, and then I also do some work on Broadway. Um, so currently I'm playing for a few shows on Broadway today at 2 o'clock. I play for the Wicked Matinee, oh, which cool. is why I'm already in my black. Mm -hmm. um, and I also play for uh, Sweeney Todd and Camelot right, right now, which nice. are the shows that have harp in the orchestra pit. Okay. And Sweeney Todd has a lot of harp, right? Has a really, really big harp part, which is so fun. It's a Stephen Sondheim musical, so we know the music is great, but the harp part is such a joy to play. Difficult, but really just a thrill every time. Wow. So I'm really enjoying that. Um, and then, yeah, living in New York, you know, so many groups and performing artists come here to put on concerts and shows, so I've been lucky to play with some really you've, fun groups. And big names, like you've played for Barry Manilow, Rufus Wainwright, uh, Bette Midler, Patti Lapone, and um, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna ask <laughs> you to play a little bit of this. You played for Florence and the Machine, right? I did, yeah. Um, back in, I think, 2012 at the uh, Met Gala, um, Florence and the Machine was the a musical guest yeah. and they have a harpist um, named Tom who plays with them on a regular basis mm -hmm. but for the Met Gala they wanted to make it even more grand as you can imagine so they had uh, two additional harpists um, play with wow. them and we got to play you, okay, you this, okay this is this is this is because you all know this but you're gonna sing with me right? well I'll try okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it's uh, that that is so cool to to know that that sound that we've heard on the radio that we've just heard like at a grocery store in the background that that's someone's actual fingers on this instrument and I think growing up seeing this instrument was always almost like a magical thing because it sounds like it's what we hear when in in movies when we when we see heaven or angels and then actually having a harp in the room and hearing the sound in person it, it really is and I'm not exaggerating it's life-changing mm -hmm. so when I when I was going to university and I befriended a harpist in Toronto Caroline who actually put me in touch with Christy when Caroline would practice and I would just be in her practice room I was like what is this <laughs> and that was the inspiration to to learn so you started at how old Christy I was two and a half which is not normal but um, my mom is a singer and um, there's actually quite a bit she's a classical singer a soprano um, so she sings in choirs a lot right so there's actually a lot of music 
uh, repertoire written for choirs and harp, choral music with harp accompaniment. So when I was around two, she had a concert with a harpist, mm -hmm. and he was playing a slightly smaller harp, and she approached him and she said, I've never seen a harp that small before. And he said, well, I teach lessons, and I, I have even smaller ones at home. And he was my teacher for the next nine years, I think. Wow. So um, I don't remember starting, because I was so young, but I've always loved it. And it's, it's, you know, starting that young, it's kind of just always been a part of my life. And um, a big part of my life, obviously. It's what I am lucky enough to do now. For a living. For a living. When did it's you amazing. when did you know that that is what you wanted to do as a career? Well, I think probably deep down I always knew that it's what I was going to do for a living because it's just such a part of who I am and, and what I do. Um, but I think there was kind of a specific moment when I was probably about 16 and I was learning this piece um, by Debussy called The First Arabesque. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember after performing it in the recital that year, just thinking, yep, this is what I'm gonna do. Wow. And I think that's maybe when I finally announced it to my teacher and my mom that yes, this is really what I'm gonna do with my life. Amazing. It's something that requires so much discipline that's what I've learned from this musical practice that if you want to do it properly and you want to do it well it's it's not just the hours of sitting at the instrument this whole 10,000 hour thing that people throw around that that I'm not gonna mention who said that <laughs> but that that there was a rebuttal mm -hmm. to that book yeah. and the rebuttal was by the scientist that, that had actually done the research that had published a paper in Europe that said he shouldn't have said just 10,000 hours because it's not just 10,000 hours it's the right teacher it's knowing how to practice and it's it's a specific amount of focus and this is something that I've only learned from diving into a regular music practice it's really really Hard. And I know like a lot of people say that about the things that I'm showing them like calligraphy or sewing and and I say or pottery and, and I, I say yeah and all of these things just require so many years of repetition but also a teacher that can show you what you're doing wrong because if you just keep doing it you might think oh if I just keep doing it I'm gonna get better yeah. but you really should have an authoritative eye to tell you what you're doing wrong and you know that yes absolutely yes it, it the heart may look like we're just strumming along um, but there's so much that goes into it and especially with classical instruments the technique behind it is so important. You know, you can't just walk up to the harp and be able to play it. There's a way to hold your hands. Um, there's a way to close your hands and pluck the strings that gives you that sound that the harp is so famous for. Um, I mean, we talk about the harp being the instrument of the angels, right? Um, and there's a famous saying that is, you have to work like the devil to play like an angel. Really? And it's really true. It requires so much work to make it look as effortless as it does. Well, this, this is something that I want to do for the rest of my life. And I, I knew this when I had played the troubadour harp. The troubadour harp is a much simpler version of this harp. It doesn't have pedals. You can, you, it's really limited what you can play on a lever harp. Mm -hmm. But after a year of playing that, I, I knew that this is something that I want to add to my life and take very seriously. I knew that I want to sit at the harp for an hour every day and practice and work towards being able to play it properly. So it was a big move to go from my small lever harp to this concert grand pedal harp this is what you play right mm -hmm. in the orchestra pit yes this is the, this is the serious version of the harp <laughs> this is we made a video about how these harps are made we went to the lion and healy harp factory in chicago where they've been making harps since the 1800s and we saw how this magnificent instrument is made and it's uh it's not something you just sort of casually pick up because 
first of all, it's heavy, so you can't casually pick it up. <laughs> but it's also, it's also very expensive. Uh, and it, if you're gonna do it, you, you take it seriously. So I just wanna show everyone genuinely what a lesson is like. Christy comes over here, we have an hour lesson, and I think we should just dive in. Um, maybe before we do that, Christy, can you talk about like what what the what this instrument is and what it's doing? Yes. Because I think people just look at it and they see strings, but there's so much more than that. Absolutely, and, and so many times people say to me, I've never seen a harp up close before, right? You see it on TV or in movies or in a book. Um, and the, the troubadour harp you were speaking about before, it's also known as maybe a Celtic or an Irish harp. Um, and, and people do play those their whole lives as well. Uh, this harp is really meant for classical music, right? So anytime you hear an orchestra or an opera or a Broadway play or a musical, I should say, this is the harp that they're playing. Okay. And what the difference between this and a Celtic harp, this harp has pedals and the Celtic harp has levers, as you were mentioning. And the levers are up here and they can just raise the pitch of each note, um, but the pedals can both lower and raise the pitch so, of the strings. So if we have a piece of classical music mm -hmm. and there are sharps and flats all over the piece of music, you can't play that on a on a troubadour Celtic folk harp, right? You can maybe try. Your hands would be really busy with moving the levers, but um, the pedal harp allows for much more ease with that. Um, I kind of like to say the pedals are like the black keys on the piano, mm -hmm. right? They give us our sharps and our flats. So we have seven pedals, one for each note of the musical alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? Seven. And each pedal has three positions. So it can either be flat, which is up, mm -hmm. natural, which is in the middle, mm -hmm. or sharp, which is pressed all the way down. So each string, we have 47 strings, and each string can produce three different pitches depending on the positioning of the pedals. So I'm gonna play my D string, which is right here, and this is my D pedal. So when my pedal is up, it's flat. That's a D flat. When it's in the middle, it's natural, D natural. And when it's all the way down, it's sharp, D sharp or you can pluck the string and then move the pedal. And then you really hear how it changes. And it's all in the mechanism up here and rods that go in the column. So this is what I didn't know until we went to the Lion and Healy factory. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that that column is hiding so many things. It is. And that's why it's so heavy. Mm -hmm. Like this, this harp is really heavy. And I can't imagine as a harpist, like mm -hmm. you have to move your harp around a lot, right? Yeah, you know, it just kind of comes with the job. But the harp, I think, is around 81 pounds. Okay. Um, so it's heavy, but it's more of just kind of an awkward weight, right? Because mm -hmm. it can tip over quickly, so you have to be very careful with it. Um, but we have a dolly that we use, so we don't actually have to pick it up. We can wheel it around, and then you put it in your car just very gently, like that. So maybe you pick it up for a second, but you don't really have to right. physically pick it up too much. The strings are something that is also very special. Mm -hmm. What I love about the harp is that the origins of it go back to ancient days. It really is one of the earliest instruments known to man, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. the lyre in ancient Greece. This is a version of that. And something that fascinated me was when I learned what the strings are made out of. Can you tell us what the, what the strings are? Please? Well, we have different materials. There's three different materials depending on which part of the harp you're in. So the, the strings up here, this is our upper register. It's um, the higher notes, right? These are all made of nylon. In the middle register, which is where we have our warmest sound, those are all made of gut. Gut, what gut. is gut? Gut is stomach. <laughs> 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 like from bovine, right? Yes. Like that's that's what the strings are made out of. Yeah. And gut strings are not just used on the harp, but they're used on many other stringed instruments as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Fascinating. I had yeah. no idea. And they're also really expensive. So when you break a string, because you're not putting it on properly, oh. 
Well, strings, strings also, because it's a natural material, they do sometimes just break by themselves. So that's something that we also have to think about, you know, during a performance, a string might break, you have to quickly change it, and then just continue on. Gosh. And then the strings at the very bottom. At the bottom, they're made of wire. So you can hear the difference. This is our bass, right? So it's almost like we have different instruments within the harp. This is almost like a string bass. Mm -hmm. This would be more like a, a warm a cello or a piano. And then up here, maybe a flute, you know, the higher pitches. So we can create so many, almost like a full orchestra within the harp. I love it so much. This is the, this is the one instrument that when I'm actually practicing, I, I don't feel intimidated about disturbing the neighbors. When I'm playing the piano, <laughs> and I keep making mistakes, it's so loud. And when I'm playing my guitar and I hit the wrong note, it's like, it's a little cringy. But with this instrument, even just, just practicing scales, it's just so beautiful that an hour flies by. It motivates me to actually practice the sound that comes out of here. Mm -hmm. So the last thing I wanna ask you about yeah. is the actual soundboard, because they talked about that at Lion and Healy, mm -hmm. the, this piece of wood. What, what's happening in this part of the harp? So this part of the harp is actually hollow in here. Um, and if you looked in the back, there's holes here too, which help us to, we can grab to move the harp a little bit too, and also to change our strings because you have to wind them through here. Um, but it's hollow here. And so the sound kind of can linger and you know reverberate in here and then the sound comes out of here. And this this is what, this is the sound board, right? Yes. And I've heard of like really scary, sad things when a harp has been neglected and the sound board has a crack in it. That's really bad, right? I think over time, yes, they can get cracks in them. Um, so you have to be really careful with humidity level of the room that the harp is in and mm -hmm. staying out of direct sunlight and all those kind of things. It's not only an instrument, it's, um, you know, it's a product made of wood that you really have to take care of and um, be careful with. Yeah. But the soundboard, you know, when you play the harp, we don't have a pedal. People ask about the pedals a lot because they know pedals on a piano. Yes. Right? On a piano, you have pedals that sustain the pitch. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're pressing the pedal, it's going to ring. We don't have that on the harp. These are only to change to sharp to flat and natural. So for us, the sound is gonna ring until it dies away, which can take a while, or we stop the sound. And you can hear this is where the sound is coming out of the sound board, and then we stop it from ringing with our hands. And this is called a muffle. When you do that? Like this. Okay. Like a muffler on a car. Okay. A muffle. A muffle, <laughs> beautiful. So shall we? have our lesson? I think so. Please? Okay, let's switch places. Thanks, Christy. Of course. So at the beginning of every lesson, we have a warm-up. And what is a warm-up doing? A warm-up, I think, is something that we do in a lot of aspects of our lives, right? If we are a runner, we should stretch before we play, mm -hmm. right? Um, for a musician, it's the same. Our body we are like an athlete at the instrument and if we come to it cold we can injure ourselves um, i think a warm-up also sort of centers your mind a bit and also helps you really be aware of your technique mm -hmm. so that when you go to play your piece you can focus more on the notes and the musicality and the fingering and all the other million things you have to think about. But the warm up just gets your hands set and ready to go in the proper position. So we've been doing a warm up that just uses triads, which are three note chords. So we start with just our right hand alone. So the thing I have been focusing on is my hand position because earlier it was like this. Mm -hmm. And Christy was like, no, you don't want the, what do they call this, a claw? A claw. <laughs> we, you know, again, with our technique and our positioning, we want everything to feel relaxed. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to do that when we're focusing on placing and plucking the strings and closing. But our position should help us feel relaxed and stay really 
comfortable there. Good. So when we play the harp, we keep our thumb high and our fingers low so that when we close, each finger has to travel the same way. So we're going to go up the scale, which is each note, all the way till we get to the next C chord. We're doing our ascending triads. And tell me why you stopped that. Because, well, I stopped because I heard my thumb didn't, my thumb wasn't doing its job. No, and it wasn't, wasn't. Doing, wasn't being good, so I have to do it again. Yeah. Because that's the that's the point of practicing is you don't you're not just hitting the strings for the sake of hitting the strings. If it's wrong, you need to fix it. Otherwise, it's, you just keep playing the thing wrong. And I think this is a fascinating thing about being a novice musician, playing the guitar by myself without any lessons. You just assume that if you keep playing, it's just going to get better. Mm -hmm. And f ten years later, I'm still making the same mistakes on my guitar pieces. Mm -hmm. So. So this specific warm-up, not only are we thinking about our position, but what you did is you used your ear, right? And you heard right away that your thumb was not as loud as the other fingers. Because what we're going for is an even sound, both ryth rhythmically and also dynamically. So if your thumb is weaker, we need to work on strengthening that. And that's why this closing, each finger closes the same way, so that you produce an even sound. Good, so you've got a good close on your thumb, right? Maybe a little bit more of a gentle close, okay. so it's not... I hear that. Yeah. It's a little aggressive. Yes. Okay. Yes. Can Which, try again, going down? we don't want any tension, right? So nice press into the string and then close. Okay. Let's do our descending. Is it press a little, a little bit, yeah. So less of an attack right. um, and more of a press. Not like, not a pull, but press. And let the fingers gently close in rather than being so sharp. full even sound and then after you play you have a really nice relaxation 
Now we're going to do our hands together. So it gets a little bit more difficult. We're going to play them at the same time. Again, we're thinking about so many things just about the hand position. Mm -hmm. But let me ask you what goes through your mind in terms of the notes. Are you thinking about the chords you're playing? No. Well, that's the next step because you can also get your brain oh. warmed up too, right? So we're not just thinking, does everything look and sound okay, but what chord am I playing? Well, I'm starting on a C major chord. The next one is a D minor chord, and so you can build in some theory behind it as well. Okay. It's always good to connect your brain to what you're playing because it helps with memorization. It helps with musical phrasing when we know what is happening harmonically with what we're playing as well. Mm -hmm. So the first step is to do that even when you're doing a basic warm up. Okay. And I think it'll help in the next part that we do, right? We do the last part of the warm up. Even more difficult right. because now we're doing a true arpeggio. We're not playing at the same time. We're doing one note at a time. So it's even easier to get off. I do. So, would so, you like to start your piece now? Yes. So now is the, the so now we would after our warm up we would move to the piece or pieces that I'm working on and I have been working on a piece that I love so much. It's is it a beginner piece, Christy? The Rue? Yeah. I would say it's a beginner to early intermediate. Okay. Um there are some pedal changes in it. Um but it it's similar to the warm-up that we just did, which is why I like this warm-up for you, because mm -hmm. there are a lot of arpeggios. I'm gonna get the music stand. Great. So this piece is called Rue, which in French is a spinning wheel, and it was written by someone named Alphonse Hasselmans. Hasselmans has written a lot of harp stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, a lot for the harp. A French composer and just beautiful music for the harp. So when I was first introduced to this piece I wasn't really thinking about it being called spinning wheel and then when I heard it played properly I was like oh wow when it's played to tempo with emotion it really sounds and feels like a spinning wheel which I happen to have a lot of experience with because <laughs> I spent like over 10 summers 10 years spinning wool on a spinning wheel and this, this piece, when it's played at the speed it's supposed to be played, it feels like the magic of the spinning wheel starting up and then going fast and then slowing down. And sometimes when you stop the spinning wheel, it turns the opposite way before it completely stops. And although this piece is not very long, it captures that feeling. So that was my motivation to 
do justice to this piece. So when we start, I play it slowly. Mm -hmm. the, so the first time you told me about this piece and you played it for me because you'd been working on it for a little bit, um, you played it how you had heard it in your mind or maybe how you had heard another harpist play it, which is with what you called this emotion, right? Which is musical phrasing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where it sounded like the spinning wheel to you, which is so wonderful and how you connected with it. But when you played it for me, it was sort of all over the place in a good way, but also in a way that we can practice to fix. So even though we want to play it with phrasing and, and not everything super machine-like, mm -hmm. in order to get that way, you have to practice it slowly and very evenly. Because even when you add the phrasing and the emotion, you have to keep the musical, the rhythmic integrity of what you're playing. The only way to achieve that rhythmic integrity is to really have a great internal sense of rhythm, and that comes from practicing very, very slowly, maybe with a metronome, mm -hmm. which I know you love to practice with. I do. Um, so I'd like to start having you play it for me very slowly. Maybe we'll do it with a metronome as well. Sure. But I'd like to hear how you practiced it this week okay. first without the metronome. And so you're setting your pedals before you start, right? This piece, do you know what key this piece is in? I don't. Well, let's talk <laughs> I, about that. I it's have very... no musical theory, and that is something else that Christy is introducing me to. Musical theory and reading music, which I really want to know how to do, and I, I just don't. So I don't even know how to learn. And that's another thing that I should mention. When you have a teacher, the, the value of having a teacher is the teacher from a professional perspective, pointing out what I need to do in order to fix things. So when I was playing the piece really fast, I knew it didn't sound the way I wanted it to sound, but I didn't know what to do to make it better. And having the teacher tell you, you need to slow it way down, and th this is what I'm hearing as a mistake, that's, that's really invaluable. Absolutely. Um, and you were saying, you don't know how to read music, but you do. It just takes a while, right? Mm -hmm. But it's fortunately something that we can practice. We can become better readers. It's like a new language. You are learning to read a language and it just takes practice. Okay. So at first you had looked at this and you immediately tried to memorize everything. Mm -hmm. So you only read it maybe once or twice and then it was gone, right? And yep. you only knew it on the harp. And what if you had memorized it slightly incorrectly? it's really difficult to change mm -hmm. that, right? So I keep telling you to really connect with the music as you continue working on it. Okay. So the music theory behind this, first we want to think what key we're in because we were putting our pedals into a certain setting. So we have B natural. Well, we look oh. at our key signature, which is this thing right here. Mm -hmm. Do you see any sharps or flats there? No. No. So no sharps, no flats. If we were in a major key, it would be C major. Yep. It'd be like on the piano, all the white keys. Mm -hmm. However, this piece happens to be in what we call a minor key. Mm -hmm. And the relative minor key to C major is actually A minor. Mm -hmm. We have a couple other hints to know that we're in A minor. The very first chord that you play is an A minor chord. Okay. We're starting with a G sharp and yep. a D sharp pedal because even though we're in the key of A minor and any other instrument would just think A minor until they saw an accidental, mm -hmm. we can preset pedals based on what that note is when we actually play it. Mm -hmm. So even though D sharp is not in A minor, the first time we play a D, it's a sharp. Right. So we can start with it in sharp, which okay. is why you preset your pedals just now. So we have the D, D sharp. D sharp and G sharp. And G sharp. And I know that I'm going to have an F sharp You're going to have an soon. F sharp. Mm -hmm. So I put my, uh, my foot is on this F pedal. Ready to go. And we mark this in the music, right? Yes. Yes. The so pedal we... changes are marked on the music. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, here we go.
we stop right there? Yes. So that was the first page, right? This piece is three pages long. Mm -hmm. Do you think you looked at the music that whole time? I didn't. No, I not didn't. the whole time, because you kind of have it memorized, yeah. right? But there were some spots where there was a little bit of uncertainty. So I would always say when you're working on it, keep your eyes on the music, especially when there's that, that uncertainty. Stop, find it on the page so you really fix what it is. Okay? So my issue now is mm -hmm. that if I was playing here and I, and I lost where I was, mm -hmm. if I turned to the music, I wouldn't know where to look. Just because I, yeah. I would have no idea. Yeah, and so that's why from the beginning, keep your eyes, be connected with the music so that you know where you are on the page. Um, I find it helpful to, to think that way as well. Even when you have something memorized, yeah. it's almost like you're reading the music in your mind, right? Because that's helpful for knowing the notes, knowing uh, when the key changes, but also if you have a memory slip, mm -hmm. you can jump to a new spot by picturing, okay, I'm gonna start at the top of page two. I know that's where the key changes to a major key. And it's helpful that way so you're not completely lost. Okay. Otherwise, if you're on stage, you have no music, you forgot what you're playing, it can be very scary. And you wanna have some solid backup okay. plans, right? Something that you know you can play by picturing it or thinking of a key change or something like that. So I should like practice this now like by looking, looking at yeah. it and then mm -hmm. playing. Okay, yeah. I'll work on um, that because I, I haven't done that. Yeah. And I haven't been doing that. It's totally memorized. I know. But the good things that are happening, right, because there are some really good things. We're hearing a good even sound, mm -hmm. both rhythm rhythmically and with the sound of the notes. Mm -hmm. You're also doing the correct fingering. And I think it's important to know that there's a lot of really detailed things that you're doing that may not even come across. But every time you have a different shape, you're using a different fingering. And that's, that's, that has all been dictated by Christy. So that's an, I'm not just randomly putting my hands on here and, and finding strings with any old finger. Mm -hmm. Every single note had an associated finger when I was learning this that Christy dictated. Mm -hmm. And it changes based on the chord. Mm -hmm. So that's what she's referring to. Yes, based on the shape of the chord. And the reason for that is that we keep that all consistent so that your hands are able to find and feel these shapes without you always having to stare at what you're playing, right? So if every time you play a triad in root position, you use three, two, one, right? Mm -hmm. And then if we do what's called a second inversion chord, mm -hmm. where the bottom two notes are a fourth away, a mm -hmm. skip and a step, we use four, two, one. And we can feel that shape quickly as well. So, another way that I've had you practice this piece is by playing these arpeggios as blocked chords. Mm -hmm. So instead of playing one note at a time, show me what I had you do. Good. So that works on a couple things, right? It works on getting our hands in the correct part of the strings, right? Mm -hmm. Good. Our positioning, finding the notes, on getting us to place them at the same time because one thing that happened when you had a little bit of uncertainty is you started to walk. I saw that. Right? I caught myself. Which at a slow tempo, you know, if I'm not watching you, maybe I maybe I kind of heard it, but can you imagine playing this quick, you know, at your fast in performance my, tempo, walking everything? No, and I know that was wrong. Yeah. In my defense, that never happens when I'm alone. Oh, when I'm alone, uh -huh, things yeah. Things are so much better yeah. when I'm alone. And, and, and truthfully, I have to say that that is another thing that has been relayed to me in these lessons. Mm -hmm. It's very different when you have someone in the room watching you. Mm -hmm. You can learn how to play an instrument, but then you also have to learn how to play it in front of people. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I did not anticipate. I, I practice and I get things to a certain place and then Christy shows up and I'm so nervous. I'm so nervous. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, she's watching, she's watching, she's watching, stop screwing up. It's just me. And the, and the <laughs> more I hear in my head, stop screwing up, the yeah. more I screw up. Yeah. So that has that is something that like you as a mm -hmm. performer, you get up on stage and you don't have a second chance. No. You can't make a mistake no. when you're 
playing with Florence and the Machine. So what, what do you do with that pressure? You know, it is, you have to remember that so much of it is in your head. It's all in your mind. Yeah. And you have to, to tune out those voices. Um, but I think the best thing you can do is feel really, really prepared. Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of the nervousness or the um, self-doubt maybe comes from not feeling 100% prepared with what you're doing. So that's why we practice for all these hours and why we you know, work on our technique and the theory behind it and everything is so that when we play, we can just focus on the music. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the best thing you can do to get to that point where you take that nervousness in your stomach and you turn it into excitement. And you're like, even in our lessons, I can't wait to show you what I practiced this week. And if you, you can really spin it in your head because it's all there. You know you can play it. Yep. And you just have to remember that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Can I try playing this? The way you would like? Yeah. Sure. Should we see what yeah, happens? Yeah, let's hear. Okay. <laughs> well, so this is interesting because now that it's faster, Mm -hmm. We're listening for what? We're listening for the melody the line. Melody, which yeah. is. Beautiful, I've great. Been practicing that. That's right. Okay. <laughs> because what you're playing are these arpeggios, right? Yeah. And that is something on the harp that's difficult to within all of these notes, you have to sing a melody, yep. right? You're playing a flute, you are blowing into an instrument and you're playing one note, mm -hmm. a melody. You can only play one note at a time. For us, we have all of these notes, but within that, it's the melody that has to come out and that helps dictate the way you phrase it, all of your slowing down, speeding up, dynamics, everything. So your melody, what finger is play? You played the, it for me, but what finger plays it? The right hand thumb within this six note figure is the only note that has the melody. Okay. playing with all of you watching. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here, think, yeah. it's just you. It's a beautiful instrument, it's a beautiful piece. Make music. That's the one, the A, F sharp, E, coming from that chord. Mm -hmm. Good, so let's do that measure again. Okay. Good, okay. Take 27. <laughs> slightest bit of hesitation, yes. but this time you knew it. Mm -hmm. You knew exactly what you were going to play. Mm -hmm. And that's the trick. You have to fix those things. You can't just every time you play them have a little mistake and think, that's It'll fine. get better. Yeah, because yeah. it won't. You have to stop and learn it. That was great. I think it's, this is where you want to go with this piece. You can hear in your mind how you want it to sound. I think we still need some of this slow practice, right? Yep. And maybe a bit of metronome, because it starts to get a little bit uneven. Mm -hmm. And once that unevenness is there, we know it's too fast. Yep. So slow it down, metronome. We want everything to just flow. I will work on that. Great. And I know we have limited time, so 
would you oblige us, Christy, and maybe play this so people can hear what it really should sound like? Sure, and Please? you know, this with a piece of music, everybody has their own interpretation, yep. which is what is so beautiful about music. And every time you play it, it can be slightly different mm -hmm. as well. So this is how maybe I might play it. Okay. Just for today, though. Will you turn my page? Of course, yes. Okay. Not yet. Yep. I'll let you know. Beautiful, thank you. So another thing we do every now and then mm -hmm. during our lesson is I ask Christy if she would just play something to inspire me <laughs> because I, I feel like having this concert grand harp in my living room, it sits there and it's like, mm, is this all you're gonna do on me? Mm, oh. Is this all you're gonna do on me? Mm, it's been a year and this is what you're doing? So when Christy comes and, and every now and then she plays something on this, on my harp, on Bonnie Charlie, mm -hmm. that's its name, I, I just feel like I can see and hear that it is possible. It is possible with many years of very hard work and practice. Mm -hmm. So Christy, would you oblige us and maybe play the piece that made you know you wanted to become a harpist, please? Sure. Thank you. Okay, so this is uh, by a French composer named Claude Debussy, and this is the first arabesque. Um, this originally would have been written for a piano. A lot of our music we borrow, steal from other instruments, so this is a transcription for the harp.
Thank you, Christy. That was Thank so you. beautiful. Wow. Well, there you have it. Inspiration from Christy Shade, my teacher, a professional harpist here in New York City. Thank you, Christy. And thank you all for watching. <laughs>